Sometimes I think, could this be the Truman Show? Is my truth the truth for most or is it like a lucid truth that's being told like when I lose a tooth or get scooped for loot? I need answers. But I think everybody answered different. Well, if not answer this shit, what's the difference between telling and living? I'm always conscious of time. They tell me I'm still young. But I'm trying to salvage my youth and live it to the fullest while the shit's still fun. Reflect a lot, neglect a lot of shit in the present I never watch, but in 10 years when you all laughing back I'll be oblivious to whatever you laughing about and I don't want that Mama needed three stacks for the roof I damn near needed three stacks for the booth I felt cast out three stacks in the booth But that was only till I got back to the crew uh, And I keep a faction of few Now it's a fraction of the past of the group. And at the end of the day, all I ask them is they can tell me the truth. My name is Terrence Batson. Uh, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, 53 years old, graduated from West Philadelphia High School, 1980. Uh, I was diagnosed with a mental illness at the age of 18 after graduating high school. Uh, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia and I had several years in my late teens and early 20s that were very, uh, very difficult, very difficult. You know, I had multiple hospitalizations uh, through the course of growing up. Uh, I was a person that abused drugs and alcohol for a period of time. So my best, my message is really co-occurring, you know, uh, eventually I, I became where I got my mental illness in remission, where, you know, my symptoms weren't so severe. I made a commitment to taking my medication as prescribed, which was something that was kind of difficult because early on I was in denial about having mental illness, uh, but I eventually committed to taking medication as prescribed because that was ultimately the, the main thing that was going to help me to get well and stay well. And I became a, a aware of an agency uh, that was in the behavioral health system, and I went and applied for a job with them. Uh, this was a wonderful agency, uh, mainly because... One of the criteria for having the job was that you had to be a person that was in recovery from mental illness and or drug and alcohol. So I fit that description very well. So in September of 1994, I got a job with this agency. And basically what we did was is we worked in the behavioral health system and everything that was, every program, every organization that was funded through the county of Philadelphia, we contracted to go out and do consumer satisfaction and quality assurance for the individuals receiving the behavioral health services. We started off early on in the mid 90s, uh, basically just doing mental health services. We would go out and visit inpatient psychiatric units, uh, long-term residential rehabs, outpatient units, uh, different residential service services like community living arrangements and supported living arrangements. And we did that for a few years and then eventually we got a contract through the behavioral health system to branch out and do drug and alcohol treatment and child and adolescent treatment. <laughs> when this took place, we started early on 
going to long-term residential rehabs for drug and alcohol treatment. We did outpatient services for drug and alcohol treatment. Uh, okay, there were other uh, services, too, that were, they basically just provided uh, therapeutic services for people with drug and alcohol treatment. It was always really to our advantage when we would go out and meet this population because the people kind of gravitated towards us and we kind of gelled with these people because we were coming out to find out, are you satisfied with your services? And the fact of the matter was that I was a person who had walked that walk. In other words, I had received those services in the past and I could relate and I could empathize with people when they wanted to share what their issues were. Our main concern was consumer satisfaction. We wanted to know what's working for you. What is helping you to live independently? What is helping you to be in recovery? What is helping you to solidify your life? Do you have any type of good family involvement? Do you have case management services? We asked people what their supports were and how their supports were working. And so I'd say from maybe 2009 to 2010 and 11, you know, I had a lot of years where I worked with this agency and I had good relationships with my coworkers. Uh, and I actually worked with them uh, until October of 2013. Uh, I continued to be in recovery, um, actually coming up on 12 years clean and sober. Uh, what happened was is that I ended up retiring in 2013 because the previous years, uh, I had a medical issue in 2011. I had a psychiatric issue in 2013. And so it was felt by me, my executive director, my staff supervisor, my fiscal director, they thought it would be better for me to step down and retire after 19 years of service. So I went along with that, and I agreed, so I came out. I transitioned back into the behavioral health system as of October of 2013. I got on disability, uh, Social Security disability. Uh, I ended up getting behavioral health services through an agency out in West Philadelphia, uh, I'm still plugged in getting my medication. I take a medication called Clauseril, and it has been working for me for plus 10 years. And so I've transitioned from being gainfully employed with private insurance to getting back into the public system. I had to go do the welfare. I had to get connected to behavioral health services. Uh, through the process of doing this, I ended up being hospitalized for psychiatric reasons because I couldn't get my medication because my insurance wasn't in place. But we did eventually get my services in place. Last year, I came to Ms. Dorsey as uh, my case manager. That was another thing that I, I received when I came into the public system, they gave me a, a intensive case manager. He has been instrumental in helping me to ascertain and to get the services that I need. Mr. My, his name is Calvin. Calvin introduced me to Ms. Dorsey last year. It was my first year of not being gainfully employed with private insurance. It was my first year being in the public system. We Sometimes I think.
could this be the Truman Show? Is my truth the truth for most or is it like a lucid truth that's being told like when I lose a tooth forget scoop for loot I need answers but I think everybody answered different as far as traumas in a session this is basically the technique or this is basically how I deconstruct one once we find the actual root of the trauma the actual reason why it happened then I know that there's going to be emotions around it because I can tell from scaling it on a scale of zero being not bothering you and 10 being is very, very strong. Once I, a person's even on the seven and up, that's too high. So we have to get it down to a zero. The way it's done is you take them back to the memory, back to the memory. It's going to be a little uncomfortable. Once they get back to the memory, they don't even have to tell me what it is. But as long as that feeling is that strong, I take every emotion that's around it and just take it, chop it down, chop it down, chop it down, chop it down. Once the, the actual feelings and emotions started dissolving, the numbers will go down. When I ask her, with, give me a number now from 1 to 10, from 0 to 10, she'll start to notice that it goes down from a 10 down to an 8. And then I'll chop it down again, all the emotions around the trauma, because the memory's still there. And she'll start to notice that it's going down to a 5. Sometimes, if you take them really, really high, trying to turn it up instead of turn it down, turn the emotion up, visualize everything that happened, exaggerate it, and it goes up to a 10, I need it to go that high, so it's easier to chop down. So back to like the seven, and as it's going down, she'll start to be able to, you'll see her body change, you'll see her relaxation across her face, the actual face start clearing. And sometimes in a lot of cases, when they start to release the fears and angers around the trauma and the actual pain, tears do fall. That's a sign that we've broken resistance, that's a sign that we've gotten through to the actual root, that we hit the root because that tells the hypnotist or the therapist that's pretty good at what he does that you've hit the nail on the button. When they cry, they've actually released and actually let go of the actual thing that they've held that long. Even if it was just a week ago or 25 years ago, they actually let go. So tears lets me know we got it. And now all I gotta do is keep chopping, keep chopping, keep chopping. And sometimes it can go from an eight actually to a one real quickly. Once I get them to where one is and they can really realize that they feel that freedom. I start to get them to imagine or go to a place where they've actually had the best time of their life. And I'll bring that feeling up and then I'll add, take that feeling, that good feeling, put it in the old memory where the old memory was, where all that trauma was. And I just, a little technique I use to actually get them to sprinkle that there. And they'll never have, ever experience it, that emotion again as far as trauma. But they always bring that other feeling up, the new one. And then I get it down to a zero and cover it up and bring a little da -da -da, break it down, and I'm telling you, hypnosis actually has a way of going in calmly, on a, a very elegant way. It's not painful. It's, let me let him go by. You get in there, and it's very, very, I won't say quick, but once, once you get that person in, in a state of hypnosis, the actual session does not last as long as maybe counseling or something like that. You, one strong, powerful session, and you can really do a lot of good with that trauma, and it can be gone in one session. All, all depend on that person. If layer after layer after layer is there, maybe two, but the average session one really session, specialized in traumas, fears, anxieties, all those ailments like that. Fear, anxiety, stress, phobia. Addictions, I do a lot of them, but a lot of people don't come for it. But cigarettes is probably the, the most strangest because you think hypnosis is really good for cigarettes, but if a person's not really ready to let go, nothing you can do with hypnosis a is going to free them. It's a fear-based, you know, fear-based reaction. If a dog bites you, that memory sticks in your head because you think now, if it really goes really, really deep down in your subconscious, every time you see a dog, you think you're going to die. But so there's different techniques for different issues. Okay, to start a hip hypnosis. I've actually done, but I, eight I, years me old. personally, I believe a seven year old on up is capable of following instructions. And believe it or not, adults are easy to go into, into hypnosis, but kids are actually the best to go into hypnosis because uh, their perception and everything else, they don't have no boundaries of beliefs or you know, limitations of no, I'm scared. So their minds are not already programmed to, you know, judge it. 
So they're easier to go right into hypnosis. She's the believed to have developed schizophrenia or the voices that I really haven't diagnosed her, but I believe that's what it is. At at least six or seven, her mom started noticing her really like talking out loud and like outbursts and stuff like that. But she let it go thinking it would be, you know, just a phase and five hundred five the husband decided it's a phase, she'll get over it. But years later she still was doing it up until just three weeks ago. And it was probably worse, you know, at, at her peak because she could it was almost impossible for her to concentrate on me until I decided to actually put every voice she told me about into hypnosis. Which I never thought of until that day. When she told me it was about six in there, I said, well, all six have to go under. Because had I tried to just do her, and she was so hyper with all of them telling her different things, she would have never been able to focus on me. So I asked all of them to gather around, and it was, she named a few, and I would name them and, and relax them all, and then finally got to her, and she went in. So I just used an ad lib of hypnosis just to, because that was a new experience to put voices, different voices under hypnosis. I never even heard it myself. So it worked. It actually worked. And she's actually doing very, very well at this to this day. I, I did it three weeks ago, and her mom is giving me updates. Like, and she's the, mind, the voice of the quieter, the outbursts, is, you know, very minimum. Is but it's still, you know, she having a little outburst, but not like all day. It was usually it used to be all day, but now it's like, and I probably she would probably need one more to really boom, because we was in a basically in a car, an emergency situation where she just said, please give it a shot. So. But she's doing, she's doing real good. So you say you were in a car, and the mom said, please, this is an emergency. Her mom called me and said, Byron, I don't care what you have to do. I'm, and she came at least 20-something miles from where she lived to West Philadelphia, 57th and Pine Street's little strip mall in a McDonald's parking lot at approximately 7.30 at night. And she said, I cannot let my daughter go to school like this tomorrow, or she will be suspended. So I, I had it on my heart. I said, we're going to do what we got to do. And that was the result. She was doing absolutely better, absolutely 100% better. And she didn't get suspended from school. She didn't get suspended. They act, believe it or not, that next day, they actually kept her home just for observation. And then the very next day, she went, and she was doing well. So she's doing all right. Awesome. Um, hey. We're Hello. We're talking about hypnosis. You want to come on out? Come on up. Enjoy the conversation. I don't get scared now. I'm not scared. I would love to stop. My feet hurt. Oh, okay, okay. They all say that. Well, take my card. I hope I got them on me. I just had them. Wait a minute. Yeah, he travels. He'll come to you. I'll come to you. I'm like a mobile hypnotist. Really? Yes, ma'am. We're just putting a little something together right now. Okay. Yeah. Are you interested in? Oh, I would like to quit smoking. Uh, can you have a seat, please? How long? Two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, God. See, we were just talking. We were about just that. talking about just explaining to her how it's different from other issues. Cigarette smoking is different from. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> you actually really have to want to stop smoking. Yes. Instead, of, now this is what I'm saying about cigarette smoking. Yes. If. You get the root cause from way back when you first started. That's going to cut off the cravings, the urges, the desires, and everything that le leads you to the day. If I get to that very beginning, what made you start, whatever, how many years ago it was. If I get to that root, yeah, but if I get to that root, that cuts off the actual reason you smoke. Really? Yes, it's not all last year and last week. And right, right, right. My first? Yeah, that very first one. I got to go into the root of where you were in your life when you decided I'm going to do it because Susie's doing it. And once I get that, boom, that cuts mm -hmm. off everything that started after that. Mm -hmm. Every kind of thought, imaginary, and all. But right now, everything about the cigarette is, is everything about your life is wrapped around that cigarette. That is true. And if I start asking you, would you like to start stop now? You would probably get ang anxious. Different, different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding I'm so, finding many, so many, many different mentality, different mentality that it seems hard. It's hard. It's hard. It seems it challenging. Seems challenging. I don't say it's hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is a challenge. Um, um, 
so, so, I'm ready for I'm this, ready for this ready. Sometimes I think, could this be the Truman Show? Is my truth the truth for most or is it like a lucid truth that's being told like when I lose a tooth or get scooped for loot? I need answers. But I think everybody answered different. Well, if not answer this shit, what's the difference between telling and living? I'm always conscious of time. They tell me I'm still young. But I'm trying to salvage my youth and live it to the fullest while the shit's still fun. Reflect a lot, neglect a lot of shit in the present I never watch, but in 10 years When you all laughing back I'll be oblivious to whatever you laughing about And I don't want that Mama needed three stacks for the roof I damn near needed three stacks for the booth I felt cast out three stacks in the booth But that was only till I got back to the crew uh, And I keep a faction of few Now it's a fraction of the past of the group And at the end of the day, all I ask them they can tell me the truth I wish I could say that the summer was mine, but the summer was rough I had to handle legalities They tried to get the weed out of me You know how they rolled in the county That pressure, that shit meant to balance me I used to use other people's opinions As if they were strict guys On just how to be or take them like they were challenges Speak to the child of me I could say fuck they perspective But to put that up in perspective I lust for acceptance and try to stay faithful Turn dreams into lessons And always stay true so no need for confessions Ain't no need for confessions I just make a track for all my detractors Them niggas sheets they getting harder to track down And bring all the snakes in the grass out I pull up on a track to make your fans more attracted to my track list I admit I'm conditioned My memory scoped in my preferences Projections onto rooms of presences Don't know how I passed on my grammar class Cause I barely thought in present tense I learned it ain't always intentions It's really more how you present the shit I swear sometimes I'm a pessimist Just to never come off on some pretentious shit it's real shit. Well, it's my fucking perception shit. Shit, I was be on some inception shit. Fucked up the rest of it. <laughs>